So I'm going to give a case-based approach towards inherited forms of diabetes. And uh, this is what I'll be covering. Uh, six different case scenarios and a little bit of an explanation as to what we should be thinking about this. <clears throat> this is a 20-year-old gentleman with excessive sweating, polyphagia, polyuria, osmotic symptoms, insulin from an early age, uh, and also had frequent urination with dribbling of urine and bedwetting from an early age. Was managed as type 1 diabetes till date. You can see over here that uh, his BMI was low. Physical examination was normal. There were no complications, uh, no history of diabetic ketoacidosis, and no clinical features of insulin resistance. Grossly uncontrolled glucose levels. And amongst the other tests, besides having normal thyroid functions, normal pancreatic imaging, and GAD negativity, there was a borderline high sodium over here and a borderline low potassium. The C peptides were detectable. The urine osmolality, interestingly, was low, indicating that we have a concentration defect in the urine. And besides diabetes mellitus, perhaps there was either central or, or nephrogenic uh, diabetes insipidus. The children, the ch rather than sister, had a progressive loss of vision and became entirely blind, was also diagnosed as type 1 diabetes at 9 years of age, had seizures, deafness, poor oral intake, and recurrent hypoglycemia, and passed on at the age of 26 years. So here we have the pedigree chart. And with this history, uh, those of you who would have the experience or the expertise would therefore subsequently go for genetic testing. And we did our initial Modi panel and then extended on to our uh, 31 gene panel and we found that this patient had a mutation for Wolfram syndrome or WFS1 mutation. This is our recent experience, uh, the largest uh, series of Wolfram syndrome from India and also one which has actually detected the first founder mutation in the world. So nowadays we should be thinking besides Wolfram syndrome, we should think about a Wolfram's related disorder wherein people have a milder illness without the syndrome and may have diabetes as an isolated disorder by itself. So there are treatment options and that is important to understand. We need to stabilize the endothelial uh, reticulum and that you could do that by giving dantrolene. Uh, simpler medications like Valparate have also been shown to have some effect and more recently combinations like uh, the phenylbutyric acid and dosodeoxycholic acid combinations known as chemical chaperones have also been used and it's actually FDA approved. So these might actually improve the longevity and the prognosis and even extend beta cell function for a little longer time. So here I would like to present a 43 year old nurse who came with lean diabetes for 15 years. She had several episodes of acute abdominal pain uh, between the ages of 28 and 35. And she was seen by our gastroenterology department. She was a staff at CMC Bello. And her risk factors for pancreatitis were largely negative, no lipid anomalies, no vasculitis. And she had, as you can see, a necrotic pancreatitis in the acute phase. <clears throat> Subsequently settled after several episodes and she was on basic bolus insulin. She was being treated by me and uh, she was an enzyme supplementation and her glucose controls are good, very compliant, well-behaved patient. Her BMI was 21 kg per meter squared. And then this is, you can see a CT scan, which was done about three years back, which showed an atrophic pancreas and intraductal calcification. So if one had seen this, we would have said recurrent attacks of acute pancreatitis, progressing to chronic pancreatitis. And I wouldn't have actually worried too much. Now, her daughter came with uh, extreme fatigue and difficulty in getting up from the spot for three years. Recurrent episodes with lactic acidosis with levels more than 10. And a clinical diagnosis was made of Mellas syndrome. And uh, the other biochemical tests to rule out other causes of uh, myopathy were essentially negative. So over here, one would think in terms of lactic acidosis, and this is a mitochondrial disorder. So this is the muscle biopsy, uh, which showed evidence of ragged red fibers. At this point of time, uh, the, the pediatric neurologist who was looking after the patient contacted me and said, 
don't you think there could be something in the family which is causing the same problem and uh, so whether the whole thing could be maternal in origin and whether the mother in fact had a mitochondrial disorder and if you really look up the literature you realize that recurrent pancreatitis can be a presentation of uh, a mitochondrial disorder a rare but a potential presentation so we did the genetic testing in our ngs lab and we found that there was a 45% heteroplasmy in the daughter indicating a more severe form of mitochondrial disorder in the daughter and a milder disorder in the mother and in fact if you use regular sanger or any of the other te- techniques you could actually miss and this is how ngs actually helps in uh, proving the diagnosis and you need of course a very focused and dedicated geneticist to actually help you pick this up why is it important to make the diagnosis of course for predictive screening in the family it's important but remember the other mitochondrial disorders actually respond to mitochondrial cocktail which includes coenzyme q10 uh, in a dosage of 100 mg thrice a day and can certainly help with the other symptoms of reducing fatigue uh, episodes of uh, lactic acidosis and but it does not really help in improving beta cell function unfortunately but definitely for the other family members it's useful it's important to remember that there's a huge uh, spectrum of disorders which happen with mitochondrial disorders as you can see over here uh, involving the ear the brain the eye the heart and the number of presentations as you can see focal segmental glomerular sclerosis uh, strokes which of course is the classic melas syndrome and myopathy and the last two are perhaps the most commonly thought about remember hearing defects is also an important presentation but they occur fairly late in life the median age being around 37 years of age okay this is a 17 year old boy who came to the endocrine outpatient uh, department with progressive visual loss and towards the evening a newly diagnosed diabetes born of second degree consanguineous marriage developmental delay uh, and uh, had poor scholastic uh, performance and also had uh, prominent night blindness as well by the age of 3 years so uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, syndromes of obesity could see over here quite clearly that he has polydactyly and he's obese and he has features of hypogonadism lack of body hair some gynecomastia and poor development of secondary sexual characteristics so uh, the classical finding as we could see here in the fundus is evidence of uh, Uh, bone corpuscular appearance indicating retinitis pigmentosa uh, and cystoid macular edema and a visual field defect which is progressively worsening and eventually leading on to blindness so here diabetes is really a milder disorder and uh, you should be focusing on the obesity syndrome per se it's a classical bart beetel syndrome uh this patient has at least four of the six cardinal uh, should have at least four of the six cardinal signs to make the diagnosis has mentally challenged state obesity hypogonadism has a distal limb anomalies and uh, retinal degeneration so uh, that's how we make the diagnosis and diabetes is really a minor issue over here but those focused on diabetes may in fact not even think about this particular condition and say obesity with type 2 diabetes so um the importance here is that uh, uh, the kind of obesity is actually central and uh, the type of uh, limb deformities is a post axial polydactyly which is classical lesser common features include hepatic fibrosis and uh, something which may look like a pseudo cushingoid syndrome as well with the facial features chronic kidney disease can be actually be quite common in up to 60% as well uh Let's go to our next case. Another patient, 17-year-old, morbidly obese girl with a BMI of 62 kg per meter squared, referred with difficulty in walking and newly diagnosed diabetes. Once again, don't get too distracted by the diabetes because anyone with such a huge BMI at such an early age, it could be something else. So, at the time of birth, birth weight was on the higher, uh, at the higher limit, around 3.5 kilograms, and early. deformity started developing around the 5th year as you can see here excessive weight gain was seen somewhere during the early part of the first year uh, during the second half of the first year as well someone diagnosed leptin deficiency outside noticing that the leptin levels were low 
and uh, subsequently was started on oral anti-diabetic agents as well. So uh, the carbohydrate-rich diet was being followed by this patient and there was no family history of any disorder. So over here, probably the shortening was a pseudo-shortening of stature because of the varus deformity and uh, the osteoarthritis in addition. The weight was 133 kilograms. She had uh, good scholastic performance, had uh, evidence of uh, insulin resistance, and her talus staging was normal. And mind you, her period, uh, menstrual periods were pretty normal as well. So here are the biochemistry that you can see over here. Uh, borderline high STPT and uh, lipid levels were essentially, in spite of the gross obesity, the lipid levels were pretty much normal. And Diabetes was out of control. Thyroid functions, cortisol, normal, and she had a grade 3 fatty liver. Now, someone diagnosed uh, leptin, but the problem over here, the normative values should be based according to age. And therefore, we have a problem because the leptin was interpreted as an adult. An adult uh, cutoff was actually being used for this child at that point of time. And so it was not leptin deficiency. Leptin deficiencies are not short stature and they do not have an increase in lean mass. And in fact, this patient had an increase in lean mass. So despite being obese, the fat content, I mean, the muscle content of the body was reasonably good. So we did a screening, a 36 gene panel for screening for morbid obesity, which we have in our lab. And uh, our geneticist came out with a diagnosis of MC4. Where you can have severe morbid obesity along with a good scholastic performance. And of course, it's interesting because even the previous case that I showed you, the screening tool is so useful. There are almost out of this 35 gene panel, about 16 of them have various um, mutations which can be, uh, which are characteristic of the Bart beetle syndrome. So there are various phenotypic presentations of the Bart beetle syndrome and this tool is really very useful. And I must credit, uh, our lab, and I should also like to credit my colleague, Dr. Nitin Kapoor, as well for uh, working up this particular case with uh, great ardor. So you can see over here that the MC4R gene has a particular characteristic and affects hypothalamic uh, function. Uh, it can be either autosomal dominant more commonly, uh, but have, can be autosomal recessive as well. Um, loss of function mutations occur in, in MC4R. And it's the most common monogenic form of obesity in childhood of adults. Okay. So when we have this 36 gene panel, we have a number of abbreviations over here. Have a put in a little key over here. And of course, once you look at the YouTube video over here, you can pause it and see for yourself that there are a number of syndromes which occur. And I think we should be increasingly looking at this in our patients, wherein you have young people with morbid obesity, uh, about 20% of them may in fact have a mutation of these. And increasingly, there may be more specific targeted therapy for these forms of obesity. Case number five, 16-year-old girl diagnosed to have diabetes during routine investigation, managed with thrice daily insulin. A recurrent history of renal stones with chronic renal failure from 12 years of age and a baseline creatinine of 2.5. Had cyclical low abdominal pain and had not attained menarche. So lack of uh, menarche and uh, diabetes. Mother was a pre-diabetic, but no other relatives were available owing to uh, a divorce in the family. BMI was within the normal range and uh, she had... Um, Tanner staging indicating that there was a uh, reasonable breast and pubic hair development, indicating adequate production of hormone and no evidence of insulin resistance or acanthosis mycocanus. So what should one consider in this sort of a patient? Well, uh, I never said she let you done, which of course someone said, could this be Turner syndrome? But the FSH and LH were within the normal range. So because of the lack of menstruation with the normal hormones, imaging was done, it showed, uh, the ultrasound showed this and of course reconfirmed with an MRI showing a biconate uterus and an absence of cervix and vagina. Uh, 
uh, the reason for the cyclical abdominal pain and uh, MRI of the abdomen showing an atrophied body and tail of the pancreas. And we did a mutation screen, which was positive for MODI 5 in our lab. So uh, this is a common and important cause for um, atrophy of the pancreas and young onset diabetes. They generally tend to have a much lower BMI than the case that you report here. Now we have a series of MODI 5 wherein they can be insulinopenic in most situations, but some can be managed with uh, oral anti-diabetic agents as well. This is a syndrome which can very often present not with diabetes, but with the other symptoms, as in this particular patient, wherein she came and uh, my colleague, Dr. Felix, uh, still manages her and she's doing pretty well other than the fact that she does have renal failure and uh, therefore requires insulin at this point of time. So, uh, just recapping on our experience with Modi and uh, the work that we have done. And of course, you do realize that uh, the syndromes of Modi in India can be quite different. Uh, Modi 2 is uncommon. And then also younger individuals in pregnancy who have a lowish BMI and uh, have diabetes in the earlier part of pregnancy, one should think about uh, uh, Modi as a potential cause as we have in this particular series. Okay, so finally we go on to our last case and a 38-year-old lady diagnosed to have diabetes at 19 years of age, present with hypospinal symptoms, diagnosed as type 1 diabetes, on examination has a lean habitus, a BMI of 17.4, has prominent veins in the limbs, Pandoscopy shows uh, diabetic retinopathy and insulin requirement is about 400 units per day. Patient is ketosis resistant. And uh, the triglycerides uh, are gorosely elevated uh, with uh, significant proteinuria in addition, indicating a glomerulonephritis, insulin resistance and uh, leanness with uh, abnormal distribution of fat and a high triglyceride level. And therefore, one should clinically think of a lipodystrophy. This is a partial lipodystrophy. As you can see, if we look at the body composition distribution and uh, with the low BMI, you can see over the head has an increase in body fat, whereas the rest of the body has uh, a redu reduced uh, body fat content. So partial lipodystrophy over here, and uh, more severe uh, forms of lipodystrophy, complete lipodystrophy can occur, generally occur with stunting and a generalized reduction in body fat. And of course, the prognosis is much worse. They have a tendency to develop uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease at a very early age and can go into cirrhosis. Now we have a fairly large uh, lipodystrophy series, which is getting published shortly, probably one of the largest in the world, wherein some of them may have a uh, formifrastate, wherein they do not need insulin, but some of the forms of partial lipodystrophy. And uh, they could be very subtle in their presentation, uh, very often being missed and classified as young onset, onset type two without gross lipodystrophic features. And of course, the genetic screening over here is very important. So thinking between the lines is important in patients with young onset diabetes. Syndromic condition should be looked for in the differential diagnosis of diabetes and genetic testing with next generation sequencing is absolutely important. Uh, I'd like to thank my whole team, uh, uh, the funding that we've had, funding organizations, uh, my brilliant scientist, Dr. Arun Chapla, and his team from the lab who have done all the wonderful work uh, without which his help we could not have uh, made these diagnoses. My colleagues, Felix and Nathan, who have contributed some of these cases and all the consultants and residents in our department as well. Thank you so much for your patient listening.